Tonight, you will see footage that is shot in actual pursuits, including footage never seen on television before. I didn't want nobody to get hurt. I panicked. This is the real thing. There are no recreations. You can't get away. You cannot get away. A speed is 90 to 100. These heart-pounding chases are filmed from cameras installed in the pursuing officers' cars, as well as police and news helicopters on the scene. Some of the footage you will see will be alarming. It is meant to be a warning. Oh my God. You'll see the fastest and most dangerous pursuits, as well as some of the most bizarre and unusual chases ever captured on film. Fasten your seatbelts. This is the ride of a lifetime that may just save your life. C.W. Jensen. I've been a cop for 19 years. I hope this program is going to be an eye-opener for you. I hope that you get to see what I've seen, the tragedy, the hurt that comes when people run from the police. Every pursuit starts out with an unknown ending. You're going to start to sweat, you're going to breathe hard, um, your heart's going to be pounding, your ears are going to be ringing. All those things happen. You can't help it. Garland, Texas. Pursuit of a robbery suspect armed with a shotgun. Dallas police began the pursuit. Texas DPS has now taken the lead. This is exactly the type of heart-pounding chase that cops hate. Heavy traffic and a desperate suspect. I have seen him uh, at times up to 90 miles an hour. He's on the inside lane, which is fortunate for the uh, rest of the, uh, the driving traffic. This man is willing to take any risk, suddenly pulling off the road, then pulling back into oncoming traffic. As he was passing, uh, he had a lot of stuff in the back of his truck, and stuff was flying out, and I can see that the troopers are very cautious how they approach the truck. The police are trying to get the entrances to the freeway closed. So they are getting ahead of uh, at some of the on-ramps here and stopping the flow of traffic, but obviously you can't stop every car at this time of the afternoon, 2.30 in the afternoon. Watch what happens as he tries to weave through the heavy traffic to get ahead of the police. Yeah, Sean, we're hearing now that the Garland Police Department is involved in the chase also, and uh, it looks like uh, they've taken up positions behind the Texas DPS. Oh, there he goes, there he goes. Oh, oh, it's turned over and the truck just crashed. He misjudged by inches, clipped the left bumper on the truck and never regained control. The police aren't taking any chances. Uh, that's the vehicle, Texas DPS coming out with guns drawn. Uh, they've surrounded the vehicle and uh, they have, they're waiting to see if there's any movement from inside the vehicle. But the driver was unconscious and everyone involved was still in shock. He was in the lane, passed me in the lane right next to me and uh, cut across over in the fast lane. He was moving pretty good. Oh yeah. I mean, he was, he was, he was pulling traffic away. It took 45 minutes to get the man out of the truck and get traffic moving again. And he was on his way to the hospital. As Captain Jensen said, nobody knows for sure how our pursuit will end, but there are three strong possibilities. You may, like this man, go to the hospital, or you may go to jail, or you may not be so lucky. If you're ever tempted to run, take one second to think about the consequences and who pays the price. Because if you run fast enough, and if it all goes right, you just might get away. But who picks up the pieces when it all goes wrong? He launched the stolen Corvette at 165 miles per hour, thinking he could elude the police, and never for a second imagining the jolting climax he was racing toward. The law closes in on him, but still he speeds on in his reckless attempt to escape its inevitable grip. It's a good thing there's no traffic right now, or innocent people might have their vehicles damaged, or far worse. As one police car is joined by another, he becomes even more desperate, pushing his Corvette far beyond his ability to control it. 
Seeing danger looming ahead in the form of a convoy of 18-wheelers, he begins to swerve. Sensing the inevitable, the police drop back, but it's already too late. He swerves to avoid two big rigs and loses his last ounce of control over his doomed vehicle. Thrown free from what little is left of his car, he rolls to a stop on the desert floor. Traffic grinds to a halt, drivers preparing for the worst. An eerie silence descends on the scene as everyone stares in disbelief at the twisted metal. Not knowing if he's alive or dead, the police approach him carefully with guns drawn. The driver lies motionless on the scorched sand. Carefully inspecting him, they see that he is indeed alive despite his reckless disregard of the law. For him, today ends miraculously in handcuffs instead of a coffin. The twisted remains of his high-performance vehicle rests as a gruesome memorial to the driver's disregard of society's rules. Surveying the terrible results of this crash, the lawmen wonder how anyone survived it. Handcuffed and hurting, the once left driver realized the awful results of his recklessness. The calm of a peaceful English countryside is about to be shattered by yet another criminal who believes his ability to evade the law is stronger than the law's determination to pursue him. He's already stolen the red sports car from its owner. Now he has to get it back to where he and his criminal cohorts can alter the vehicle beyond recognition. Speeding recklessly up the highway, he whips back and forth from lane to lane and speeds unslowed through intersections. Now, as he encounters more traffic, he must become even more daring, cutting in and out among other cars and even creating a third lane. Remember, in England you drive on the left side of the road, but anywhere in the world this criminal represents 2,000 pounds of disaster waiting to happen. Now begins the inevitable end of the chase. As he speeds up, he must swerve around a truck and avoid an oncoming car at an intersection. As the traffic increases, so do the risks as he overtakes yet another car at a roundabout. Now, as he reaches what appears to be open road, he speeds up in hopes of reaching his destination. Ever more confident, he races ahead, oblivious to the danger that awaits him in just a few short seconds. The seemingly open road is a siren's call to this man, luring him to ever greater speeds. As he tries to pass, he misjudges speed and distance, demolishing his stolen car on the rear end of this slow-moving truck. Notice that the impact is so severe that it whips the front of his car around so that he hits the truck a second time. Stunned, both he and the driver of the truck remain in their damaged vehicles. When he stole this car and careened down the motorway, did he have any idea of the violence with which his misadventures would end? Now the driver gets out and comes around to find out exactly what happened. Peering into the car, he checks the condition of the thief who so casually risked the lives of others. Other cars squeeze by, seemingly oblivious to the drama that surrounds them as the truck driver continues to offer help. At last, police arrive to take charge of this senseless scene. What you are about to see is something that only a few people ever witness, and they're almost always dressed in blue. But thanks to this camera, mounted on a police car's dashboard, you'll sit right next to the police officer on this high-speed chase. So fasten your seatbelt and get ready for another of the world's scariest police chases. The driver of the white pickup truck, a suspect in a Warren, Michigan bank robbery, decides that he can outrun the law. Moving to the shoulder of the road, he picks up speed as the police officer follows, desperately trying not to put any innocent lives in jeopardy. Weaving back and forth across three lanes of the freeway, he still thinks he can outrun a law enforcement officer. Now he exits the freeway gunning his way up an off-ramp, oblivious to what might be at the top. 
confronted with traffic, he simply squeezes between the cars and makes an illegal right turn onto a busy street. A few hundred yards, and it's right again, this time into an alley. He briefly loses control as he runs over a curb. Regaining control, he speeds down a street in this quiet residential area. Still, he thinks he can outrun the law. Unfamiliar with the territory, he turns into what will prove to be a cul-de-sac. When cornered, he simply squirms out from the police car's blockade and escapes again. Re-entering the main street, he is met by two more patrol cars. As they try to force him to stop, he runs another car off the road. Still, he speeds on as he travels at more than 60 miles per hour. Running a yellow light, he picks up speed as he makes a mad dash toward the freeway. Now he re-enters the freeway with the three police cars still in hot pursuit. Amazingly, he speeds up yet again and for half a mile or so seems to be putting distance between himself and the pursuing officers. He truly believes he can escape. But the police close the gap and try to box him in. Somehow, once again, he escapes their grasp. Accelerating to an even greater speed, he evades both traffic and the police as he heads toward the open road. Now, this policeman, through whose eyes you see this reckless criminal, takes the lead in the chase. Notice the squad car pulling onto the freeway to your right. But again, the police lose ground, as they must hold to a speed that does not endanger the lives of innocent drivers. For reasons known only to himself, he leaves the freeway. This time, the police officer can safely move in on him, sideswiping his vehicle and boxing him in. Now, he stopped for good. Ironically, it's right below a no parking sign. The police officers leave their cars and cautiously approach the vehicle and its driver, their guns drawn. Policemen never know when a routine traffic stop will result in a high-speed chase that finds them pitted against a desperate criminal who will do anything, including risking his life as well as their lives, to escape. And they know better than anyone that when they corner him, they may be met with more violence because a fleeing felon responds like a wounded animal when he's cornered. Yet still, they must always remember that in the United States of America, even vicious criminals have the right to arraignment and representation at a fair trial. The arresting officer reads this suspect his Miranda rights, telling him, among other things, that he has the right to remain silent and that anything he says can and will be used against him in court. But this man knows all this because, as it turns out, he's a cop. At last, he emerges. But despite having his hands cuffed behind his back, he continues to resist. Even though he's surrounded by police, he refuses to cooperate. Now they push, pull, and drag him into the squad car for a ride that will be far less thrilling than his last one. Callahan County, Texas. Here's an angry 16-year-old driver who thought he could outrun the law. Incredibly, the teenage driver survived with a broken back. San Diego, California. Here, we get a chance to see a high-speed pursuit from inside a San Diego police helicopter. This chase began when the police spotted a suspicious car near a local high school. And, uh, this guy's very 505, passing all kinds of people on the wrong side of the road. This is the actual police radio transmission. Notice the helicopter pilot's reaction as the suspect hits a van on this narrow road. Holy smokes! Man, this guy is driving like a total idiot. In San Diego, they have a problem most cities don't. A suspect knows that if he can get across the border into Mexico, police can't follow him. He's going towards the border. Man, he's out running me. Uh, speed is about 90 to 100. He's uh, taking the last U.S. exit. He's gonna run. If he runs, Kevin, I'm gonna put this thing down. He's going over I-5 westbound on Dairy Mart. Holy, he almost hit that construction guy. He's gonna bail and go over the fence. I know. He's 
gonna run across the fence here. Okay, he's going to Mexico. Hang on, watch the cranes. I got the cranes. Well, but the cranes are gonna get me in the way here. I'm climbing. Before they could land, the suspect got over the fence and across the border. Okay, well, he is in Mexico. Hispanic male, white t-shirt, black pants, white tennis shoes. This is one of those times the bad guy got away, but he left something behind. Hidden in the undercarriage of the car, they found three pounds of cocaine with a street value of $150,000. His drug dealing friends in Mexico may make him wish he'd been caught in the USA. Coming up on the world's scariest police chases, Top speed, red line, pedal to the metal, world's fastest pursuits. And the most unusual chases ever caught on tape. A runaway tank terrorizes a town. Speed, the ultimate thrill, the American dream. For the love of speed, we've built faster machines and better roads. But when you combine speed with desperation, you get the world's fastest pursuits. Because of the adrenaline dump, it, it becomes a very exciting event. You become challenged. This is what's called in many circles contempt of cop. This person running from you has disobeyed you, and you're going to go get them. Tampa, Florida. Pursuit of teenagers in a stolen car. This has to be one of the briefest pursuits in history. From the time these teenagers first see the police, decide to make a run for it, hop the curb, hit the tree, careen back onto the road, lurch once more into the park, and finally stall out in less than a minute. It's every driver's nightmare, a runaway truck. 13 tons of steel moving at untold speeds that can crush anything that dares stand in its way. Weaving from lane to lane, the fugitive begins his inescapable journey toward complete loss of control. Fortunately, a police car in front of him warns other drivers of the danger that follows. Shots are fired in an attempt to puncture the tires of this juggernaut from hell, but they have no immediate effect. Now, weaving wildly, hurtling along at speeds of 100 miles an hour, he's driving like a man possessed. The lack of markings on the truck indicate to the officers that there may be an illicit cargo inside and a criminal determined to make his escape. As the police shoot out one after another of his tires, the driver becomes even more desperate in his futile attempt to keep his truck on the road to Dallas. A cloud of dust rising from the destroyed tires obscures the officer's views. One officer moves closer, increasing the chances of an accident. He attempts to pass a car, but the combination of his reckless speed and a slight downhill grade brings him even closer to complete loss of control. Now the car he had tried to overtake pulls partly off the road to escape this raging behemoth. Watch carefully as he begins weaving to the right and sideswipes the guardrail. He briefly regains control, but now he's about to leave the road for the last time. Somehow, in an attempt to come to a stop, he keeps his truck going straight ahead. Now, as he slows, the police close in on him. Seeing the overpass ahead, and fearful of crushing himself against its cement walls, he applies even more pressure to the brakes. Miraculously, he stops upright in the ditch, and this pursuit ends as officers close in on him. Guns drawn, they carefully approach the cab, not knowing if this fugitive is armed or just insane. Cautiously, they move in, ready to shoot. They ask themselves what kind of a deranged person launches a big rig down a highway at 100 miles an hour. Now they escort the driver towards a ride of a very different kind. 
the troopers return to their cars, having saved countless motorists from the ravages of this metal monster. When asked why he made this suicide run, he answered, the devil was trying to kill me. He was charged with aggravated assault. We're now in Phoenix, Arizona, where the pursuit of a stolen pickup truck turns into a tragedy. This brand new truck was stolen from in front of a convenience store less than 20 minutes before. Okay, now this person's more or less boxed in, but uh, look at that, cut right into this. This person seems uh, bent on uh, a, a rather suicidal path. Big, very heavy traffic, slowing this fellow down somewhat. Uh, they keep on taking the center lane. This high-powered truck has managed to stay well ahead of the police. Crews are coming up ahead, has the road partially blocked. Going right through that intersection into a residential neighborhood now here on the west side of town. Incredibly, the driver of the truck is ejected from the cab and thrown clear of the wreck as it shatters around him. Amazingly, he avoids being crushed as the truck rolls over and over. Dazed from the crash, he staggers to his feet and once more tries to get away. But this time, he doesn't get far. Miraculously, the driver of the other car survived. People who run from the law all have one thing in common. At some point, they all think they can get away. Three fugitives in an old but still powerful sedan began what they think is their escape, but in reality is just a delay of their capture. Careening from lane to lane on this heavily traveled surface road, they ignore the police officer's screeching siren, endangering everyone else on this busy street. Finding themselves in a left turn only lane, they speed through a red light. Watch carefully what they do next, because you'll see them try the same escape maneuver several times. Now they turn across oncoming traffic, daring the officer to follow. Re-entering the main street, they again prepare to cut through a gas station. The policeman tries to head them off, but the driver accelerates, again eluding capture. Now he cuts through a third driveway and emerges racing up the wrong side of the street. Ignoring both a blind rise and a curve, he pulls out to pass slower moving vehicles. Amazingly, he leaves the street and begins tearing through an open field. Dodging telephone poles in a deadly slalom race, he hurdles toward another open highway. In what happens next, you'll see that the strain of eluding the law is beginning to levy its toll on his driving skills. Now he pays even less concern to safety. He snaps a stop sign in half. but not on his willingness to risk the lives of those around him. He forces his way between two cars, narrowly misses both a pedestrian and a turning car, and shoots through another red light. Again, he cuts through a parking lot, and again the officer tries to enter the street ahead of him and cut him off. But the suspect's desperation to escape is greater than the policeman's willingness to risk an innocent life. So he again accelerates, increasing the distance between himself and the pursuing officer as he runs another stop sign. A cloud of dust temporarily blocks the officer's view. The fugitive loses control for a moment. 
but he quickly regains it, hurtling toward another busy intersection. Cutting another corner, he re-enters the street. The officer, unwilling to risk an accident, now begins to fall behind. Increasing his risk-taking, he enters a busy intersection. Miraculously, an accident is avoided as alert drivers slow down and let him pass. Now the policeman closes in as the driver of the fleeing vehicle encounters impenetrable traffic. The left rear door opens. Perhaps the passenger in the back seat is considering jumping out. But he thinks better of it and closes the door. Seemingly confused, the driver temporarily maintains a low rate of speed. Now a second police car pulls up and threatens to box him in. But the fugitive dodges toward the squad car, accelerates and increases his lead. Now he leaves the road for what would prove to be the final time. Bringing his disabled car to a near stop, he allows the passenger in the back seat to attempt a getaway on foot. This chase is finally over as the officer, gun drawn, brings it to a close. Minneapolis, Minnesota, a dangerous high-speed pursuit of a fleeing bank robber. As smart as we try to be, as innovative as we try to be, there are some times when these situations will conclude with deadly force. This is a case where the bank robber is believed to be firing at the police. The police decide to shoot out his tires. We want to pull up behind him at a clear spot where he can take his tires out with a shotgun. An officer with a shotgun takes aim behind the fleeing car. Shot fired. Shot fired. Shot fired. Valley Creek Road. Shot fired. I believe the suspect vehicle is smoking. 61. His tire is out. Officers will use deadly force when that moment comes, when they realize that they must do it to protect the life of someone else. The driver still refuses to surrender. When all else fails, the officers are ordered to force the vehicle off the road. Bank robbery is a very serious crime. When officers are being shot at, it's a natural instinct to shoot back. And, and, and I don't have a problem with that if you're not putting the public at risk. Yeah, be advised, I got a signal 19. He's doing uh, well over 90 now. He's not stopping. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Pursuit of armed suspects. Here's a situation where the bad guys have a souped up car that was much faster than the patrol cars. Unable to stop the suspects in the stolen car, the officer asks for assistance from the truckers up ahead. Fortunately, one of the truckers is an ex-deputy sheriff from Alabama. He's coming right behind you now, coming up on your left. High rate of speed. Oh yeah, I got, I got him coming up here now. Move, moving over. Racing down the center divider, the suspects try to accelerate past the truck. Barely missing another police car, the suspects pull back onto the road. Now it's getting deadly. What happened next surprised everyone. Realizing they would never get past the truck and might actually die trying, these two desperate suspects finally just gave up. Thanks to a helpful trucker. More to come on world's scariest police chases. A maniac in a tank. Yeah, he's rolling over just about anything he wants to. The chase you are about to witness is not only scary, it's highly unusual. You'll understand why in just a few minutes. Campbell County, Georgia Sergeants Randy Baird and Gary Perkins in Unit 711 begin a frightening high-speed pursuit over a night-shrouded freeway.
Now, as the fleeing suspect enters a tunnel, the incandescent lights for the first time give the police, and us, a good look at his car. Emerging from the tunnel, he encounters another convoy of big rigs. Somehow, he slithers between the huge trucks and accelerates as he reaches open highway. Now, a squad car closes in and overtakes him on the left. The policeman succeeds in pushing him onto the shoulder. This case appears to be over. But somehow, desperate to avoid capture, the suspect speeds up, outrunning even this powerful police car. Now the policeman narrows the gap. Sergeants Baird and Perkins close in. They are trying to ram the suspect. But somehow the fugitive coaxes even more horsepower out of his vehicle and pulls away. Now he swerves again, avoiding yet another truck. Unit 711 closes in again for another attempt at a ram. so close they are almost touching, they reach speeds well in excess of 100 miles an hour. Again, he pulls away and encounters more traffic. The lead police car pulls in behind him as Sergeants Baird and Perkins attempt to draw alongside. But he changes lanes, forcing the drivers to drive in tandem, thus rendering a blocking maneuver impossible. And he briefly loses control as he slips off the pavement. Somehow, he pulls back onto the highway, and the pursuit continues. Having successfully negotiated a curve, he once more puts distance between himself and the cars chasing him. Another lighted tunnel gives us a brief glimpse of this reckless fugitive. Watch carefully, because he is actually about to leave the road. He's cornered, and Unit 711 rams him. Hard. He coaxes his crippled vehicle back into action, and the pursuit begins again. Well, uh, Roger, I'm out of gas. I've rammed him hard, but I'm out of gas. Hear me? Here's what makes this chase so unusual. Out of gas. The pursuit must end, for now. Pursuit and consequences. 
the people who run, and the price they pay. Now you to stay off the air. If you're ever tempted to run, take one second to think about the consequences and who pays the price. Because if you run fast enough, and if it all goes right, you just might get away. But who picks up the pieces when it all goes wrong? What scares police officers is to be chasing a bad guy and to have that bad guy smash into a car that 30 seconds earlier was just somebody going to the 7-Eleven to get a quart of milk. That's what scares cops. Atlanta, Georgia. Here we see the all too frequent tragedy of a driver who thinks he can outrun the police. Okay, he's not stopping Atlanta. Okay, I'm getting him over an emergency line. Okay, he's trying to run on me now. He's getting off on the loop. This is a police officer's nightmare. This driver has passed the officer. He thinks if he goes just a little faster, maybe he can get away. The fleeing truck is struck by one car, lifted into the air, then struck broadside by another. What you are about to see now is a grisly story of one man's crime and punishment. This pursuit began as a robbery in a suburb of Denver, Colorado. The teller in the bank recognized this man, Philip Hutchinson. As soon as the bank robber left, the teller called the police and the chase was on. All officers, 45, 93. The news helicopter watched as the thief raced through suburban streets trying to elude the police. Adams County, it's reportedly Adam William Tom 271. Attempts to stop him turned into a deadly game of chicken. One officer couldn't get out of the way in time. As the helicopter pilot watched in horror, the suspect hit the officer, killing him instantly. Hutchinson never slowed down. But moments later, he lost control of his vehicle coming out of a turn and smashed into a tree. Taking the money and a gun, he ran through empty yards looking for another vehicle, trying to stay ahead of the police. Because of radio difficulty, the helicopter pilot was unable to tell anyone exactly where the suspect was. In a nearby parking lot, the bank robber spotted a young woman in a car with her baby. He tried to force his way into her car. Infuriated when the woman would not stop, he pulled out the gun and began to fire. When he first came up and opened my door, the thing I was thinking, he's going to be in my car. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? What's going to happen? Is he going to kill me? And that's whenever I've never seen a man with a gun put his hand on my child, and that's whenever I realized, uh, uh uh, and I took off. I thought he shot my baby for some reason because the door's open. I hear a gunshot, and I thought for sure he had, he had shot him. I just I thought I was dead. Within moments, he had found another hostage, forcing a 73-year-old man to drive him out of town. Boy, I, this is it, John. I don't think you'll see tomorrow. He told me that I was a dead man if I didn't hurry and start that car. He told the man he would kill him if he made any attempt to signal the police. The police finally come to where the helicopter is hovering, but the suspect hides on the floor of the truck, and all the police see is an old man driving slowly down the road. While I'm climbing up, I bring the power in the helicopter to start climbing up, and the police cars drive past him. And Jim and I start screaming, what? And that's when I decided to, I needed to do something else. I had what's called a window of opportunity, which was maybe 10 seconds. I had to do it now, or it was history. The pilot realized that if the truck got to the main road, this man would probably kill the hostage. At that point, he dropped the helicopter in front of the fleeing truck. Then that helicopter is on the ground, right in front of me. I can't move nowhere. And he told me, ram it, ram it. And that blade was going around and everything. And I said, oh my God, we're going to get cut in pieces or something's going to happen to us. Then pretty soon, ping, ping. The helicopter was able to block the truck while the police came up from behind. 
The suspect pointed his gun at the police and then tried one final time to kill the hostage. But in the midst of all the shooting, one officer was able to pull the elderly man out of the truck, thus saving his life. When the officer decides to pursue, I think the thought process is the same as if he or she is going to shoot or not to shoot. And the end result could be as serious, if not more so, because this, this is the same as a 2,000 pound bullet. Here we are in Coronado Beach, California, with a typical and tragic example of a pursuit in which the person ran simply because they were being stopped for a ticket. Hey, Abel, can you go ahead and call it? Abel, we're 97 overhead. Some people run thinking this is a game between them and the police. But to innocent bystanders, it isn't. OK, he's just 1183 at the next intersection. Keep going. OK, okay he is uh, bailed out. He is running. Tragically, what the driver didn't realize was that an innocent bystander was sitting here waiting for a bus. Miraculously, the bystander survived. Wayside Prison, Valencia, California. This man lost everything because of a joyride that led to a pursuit in which he hit a police officer. I just had a crazy thought. I said, well, I could take this truck for a ride. And I jumped in and I took off. He was sentenced to a mandatory third strike, 50 years to life. I didn't want nobody to get hurt. All I wanted to do was get away. Unfortunately, somebody did get hurt. And he and that person has to live with it. We both had to live with it. This Dallas, Texas chase, which you will witness from the bird's eye view given you by a police helicopter, will end like virtually every other one, with the fleeing criminal in handcuffs. But right now, he thinks he can get away. Call it contempt of cop. His own safety, much less that of others on the freeway, is of no concern to him whatsoever. All he can think of is escape because he's just robbed two banks in one hour and he's got $200,000 of stolen money in his car. The police helicopter tracks him carefully, watching for a moment when patrol cars, which are keeping their distance out of concern for other drivers' safety, can move in on him. Unfamiliar with the road, he picks up speed to 100 miles an hour, not knowing that in less than a minute, he's going to encounter a formidable obstacle. From his vantage point in the air, the helicopter's pilot knows what this barrier will be and assumes that it will swiftly stop him, bringing to an end this senseless pursuit. The driver, ignorant of what is now just seconds away and oblivious to the helicopter relentlessly tracking him, is beginning to think that he's going to get away. Now he confronts it, a toll booth that forces all cars to a stop, all but his, that is. Smashing into another vehicle, his car is disabled and comes to a stop. Now, alone and going nowhere, he reaches for one of the two guns he has in his car. Emerging from his vehicle, surrounded by police, he waves a pistol at them, daring the officers to shoot him. The nerve-jarring standoff continues. Unexpectedly, he tosses his gun at the officers. They cautiously come out from behind their cover, unaware that he has a second pistol. But there's something about his demeanor that makes them suspicious. Now the police retreat again, knowing that he is still armed and suspecting that he is lethally desperate. Again, the police order him to throw down his weapon. Again, he refuses. As this bizarre drama unfolds, four police cars surround him, and more than a dozen place themselves as shields between the bank robber and hundreds of men and women, now trapped in the backup at the toll booth. Still, the suspect refuses to obey the officer's orders to lie prone on the ground, and still they crouch behind their doors, guns leveled at the kneeling robber. Now other police cars cautiously move forward, hoping that a show of overwhelming force will convince this criminal to surrender. Hundreds now wait. They're irritated by the traffic jam, but they should be relieved that they were not injured by this runaway bank robber. Now, cautiously, the police start to come out from their cover a second time. One by one, they rise up, guns drawn and leveled at the still defiant suspect. 
Now, one officer, giving the robber a wide berth, runs to another squad car to confer on their strategy for taking this felon down. Now, the police rush him, forcing him to the ground and handcuffing him. This chase is about to end like nearly every other one, with the once daring suspect surrounded by police and faced with a jail term. For every one of these officers, today began like every other day in a policeman's life. He or she left home and family, not knowing if the day would be a quiet one filled with routine traffic stops, or one like this, with a desperate bank robber leading him on a 100 mile an hour chase and then pointing a loaded gun at his head. These officers are like all police at the end of a hot pursuit. Their hearts are pounding and their adrenaline is pumping furiously. Still, despite their fear, now turned to anger, they show remarkable restraint in dealing with a man who just seconds before had threatened to kill them. Now, their suspect subdued and disarmed, they'll return to their homes and families, safe for now, and prepared to put their lives on the line again tomorrow morning. Coming up, more action. On World's Scariest Police Chases. We just heard a crunch in noise, crunch, crunch, crunch. A suspect gets away. A woman falls out of her own car. Some pursuits are frightening, some are reckless, and some are just plain bizarre. These are just some of the strange and unusual things that happen when people run from the law. Inglewood, California. When it comes to bizarre chases, the police are still puzzled by this one. An officer saw the man and woman inside this car having an argument. But when the officer tried to stop the vehicle, the driver roared away without giving the woman a chance to close her door. Then, when the driver executed this unusual U-turn, both the passenger and the driver fell out of the car. Get on the ground! Ma'am, are you okay? Even then, the officer couldn't get this man's attention. I told you, get on the ground now! Get on the ground! Get on the ground now! That's an example of why people will run, because uh, they're arguing. There's no reason for them to run, but they run, they're obviously not uh, buckled in with some safety valves, the door flies open and they fall out. Fortunately, no one was hurt, and, and fortunately it ended up reasonably well, although I'm not sure where the car went after they fell out. Silmar, California. This suspect was ahead of the police until he made one slight error. But when someone really wants to get away, they don't let one little mistake slow them down. Watch what happens now. Incredibly, the man survived. The squad car's red lights flash and the siren wails. But not only does she refuse to stop, she speeds up. Another criminal who mistakenly believes that she can outrun the law. She can't. She's been arrested a phenomenal 18 times for driving while under the influence of alcohol. But she's back behind the wheel today. It's only the middle of the day and she's already gin-soaked and very, very dangerous to anyone on the road with her. She is now desperate to escape. Bronson, Florida officer Mike Layton is chasing her at speeds up to 110 miles per hour. Hurtling through the backwoods of Florida, she hammers the accelerator even harder. This witch's brew of speed and alcohol is lethal. Incredibly, this woman has a .44 blood alcohol content. Allowing her right wheels to briefly escape the edge of the pavement and weaving around another car, she now begins a series of swerves that will prove to be fatal. After swerving again, she manages to regain control for a moment, but quickly loses it as the unpaved shoulder draws her nearer and nearer to her death. Officer Layton observes that now, with each swerve to the right, she edges farther and farther off the pavement. 
Then, overcorrecting for her error, she moves farther to her left, leaving her less and less in control of what would prove to be her steel coffin. But still, she refuses to slow down. Obviously, her drunkenness has made her feel invincible. Now, she leaves the pavement for what would prove to be the last time in her unnecessarily abbreviated life. Having slipped the bounds of gravity, she rolls over and over in the pine forest, careening from tree to tree on her one-way journey to eternity. By some fluke of fate, her car will come to a stop upright. Officer Layton also comes to a stop and prepares himself for the grisly scene he's about to observe firsthand. He's seen it so many times before. The twisted metal, the shattered glass, the broken bodies, lives needlessly ended. He's joined by a second policeman. Approaching the vehicle, they prepare for the inevitable, and they find it. Another drunk driving statistic. On the seat beside her, a half-empty bottle of gin. Clarkston, Michigan. One of our most unusual pursuits began when this officer stopped a drunk driver. The camera mounted on the dashboard of his car is running as he takes the intoxicated woman into custody. The officer handcuffs the woman with her hands behind her back and places her in the back seat of the squad car. But watch what happens when his back is turned. With the camera still rolling, the woman somehow gets into the driver's seat, gets her handcuffed hands in front of her, and roars off drunkenly down the road. Driving at speeds of over 100 miles per hour, the handcuffed woman finally loses control, goes into a spin, and stalls in the middle of the highway, where the police find her moments later. The police car was not damaged. This was fortunate, because the Clarkston Police Department has only two cars. Nobody kisses their wife or their husband goodbye to go to work and say, Honey, I hope I get into pursuit tonight. Next on World's Scariest Police Chases. Get out of the street and go back in your house. You're in danger. A day of terror. A tank on the rampage, and there was nothing the police could do. We're running out the front door, and there's a tank coming down the street. And just as I got out of the driveway, he ran over my truck. San Diego, California, pursuit of a stolen military vehicle. For sheer terror, nothing has surpassed the day this city was held hostage by a deranged man who went on a rampage with a 100,000 pound tank. I'll call it the best I can. I'm trying to get this whole uh, mess on videotape. Okay, in big trouble. Uh, yeah, that's putting it mildly. The police were able to find out that this man had armor vehicle training and had stolen this tank from the local armory. He was also known to have a history of emotional problems. When I first heard it, I thought it was a joke. This is bad. He's running over fire hydrants. You got hydrants that are blowing water in the air. Get your loudspeaker down, please. This is the San Diego Police Department. Everybody go back to your house and get off the street. He's doing these cars on purpose. We heard the rumbling sound, and um, I saw a tank coming down the street. Thought it was a drill or something. Cars that are following him, I have no idea why. Oh, my God. Oh! I was in the locker room uh, at the end of my shift and I heard the call come out on the radio, so I went back and got my patrol car and headed to the area. This is the San Diego Police Department. Get out of the street and go back in your house. You're in danger. See if we have any SWAT equipment that can help us out with this thing. He was coming, we just heard a crunch a noise. Crunch, crunch, crunch. It was during that time of day where people are getting off work or out of school. He's coming up towards the school. Okay, 10 for it was a lot of people here. A lot of them were just in shock. I didn't think they were ever going to stop him unless he ran out of gas. Somebody get a hold of the armory and find out if this thing is loaded. The gun, he was, circ you know, it was circling while he was driving, so we thought maybe he was taking aim at something, you know, to fire it.
the front door and there's a tank coming down the street. That palm tree is on the front of the tank. And just as I got out of the driveway, he ran over my truck. He took out the telephone poles over there and he headed down the street and ran over that blue car right there. And then he went back and he ran over the fire hydrant and just kept on going. This is like a war zone over here. And I know he hit one occupied vehicle with a, with a family in it and they, they just barely escaped before the, the car was crushed. He hit the pole, dropped them like they were toothpicks, and just snapped them down on the ground. What kind of a person is inside this tank? What I was told was he uh, had served in the uh, Army as a, a tank crewman. So he definitely had tank experience. He had the same school that I had gone to. When I got behind him, just before he got on the 805 southbound freeway, he had tried to run over a couple of police cars that, uh, that got in his way or, or that he could see and maneuver to, and it was still going at a good you know, 60 mile an hour clip up the freeway. They called our, our SWAT guys to see if they had anything in their arsenal they could stop him. They do not have the ability. They do not. That's do not. They uh, called the National Guard Armory to see what they could do to stop it. Those weren't viable options because the, the Armory was miles away by that time. The tank, the tank comes equipped with a, uh, what they call a nuclear biological chemical warfare system in it, which means he has fresh air to breathe, so if we used any chemical agents, they'd have no effect. At this point, the man in the tank fell back on his military training. He decided to cut off his pursuers by putting a barrier between himself and the police. He tries to knock down a pedestrian bridge across the freeway. When he got on the freeway, he made an abrupt right turn and he struck one of the uh, support pillars that hold up this uh, pedestrian footbridge. My concern was he was trying to collapse the bridge to prevent us from falling him. Well, after a while, he, he gave up on trying to knock this pole out. He continued on south. One of my concerns was that he may have live ammunition on board. He might make a stand and start fighting. At this point, it looked like he's trying to uh, maneuver the tank into the oncoming traffic. And if he had done that, we would have had a, a major chain reaction accident. Oh my god. Able. The police know that the gravest danger still lay ahead. They didn't have time to stop traffic coming down the opposite lanes of the freeway. If this man had gotten the tank free and into those traffic lanes, the results would be horrible. I used the bolt cutters and cut the hasp on the bolt, twisted the lock off, and opened up the hatch. At that point, we could look down in and we could see the driver. He never answered us. He looked back and uh, he made eye contact with Paul, so he knew we were there and he could see both Paul and I through the hatch. Well, right now, he's trying to come undone and the, the uh, pavement underneath him is breaking up. It's possible if he keeps uh, jerking this thing side to side, he might be able to break that pavement loose and roll again. The tank had to be stopped right now and the driver had to be stopped and Paul had to get in there and take control of the tank. So I fired one round, struck him on the shoulder and traveled diagonally down through his body and it was it was an immediate fatal wound. Hold it here. I need to back in and I'm not trouble. Had he not become high center on the center divide, I have no idea what would have happened. Uh, I know the people on the other side of the freeway had been hurt or killed because there wasn't room for that tank and all those cars over there. A bizarre and terrible reminder of just how powerless we are. When we come back with world's scariest police chases, a frightening pursuit on Easter Sunday morning, and two officers are an inspiration to us all. As long as they think they can get away, some will run and some will crash and burn. But when people criticize the police and their pursuit policies, they might consider this officer, who ended a pursuit by risking his own life to rescue a fleeing suspect from certain death in a burning car. Luckily, he and his partner were able to pull the driver to safety just seconds before the gas tank exploded. 
This man owes his life to cops who truly believe that they are there to protect and serve.